My name is Tucker Johnson, and I am your host today as we experience NIMSY Live, where we talk about the latest and the greatest in translation, localization, internationalization, culturalization, and all that fun stuff global companies need to delight their international customers, or at least not to piss them off too much. On this program, we invite guests who like to have fun and have some value to add for our audience of globalization professionals. I am always eager to provide a platform to those with a good story or a good data set. So let us know if there are any topics you'd like covered or guests we should reach out to for future episodes. If you haven't already done so, make sure that you're following, subscribing to Nimsy Insights on the platform of choice. We're coming to you live today from... LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, uh, probably a couple other sources as well. If you're not joining us on LinkedIn, I would encourage you to go join us on LinkedIn. That's where most people join us. Uh, make sure that you're participating in the comments section. I'm going to bring up the comments on screen here today. So if there's any questions, comments, criticisms throughout the screen, um, you can join the conversation. This is a live event on social media, so I encourage you all to get sociable here on LinkedIn or your platform of choice. Uh, you can also show your appreciation um, during the stream by hitting those like, haha, disagree, confused buttons, and those will pop up onto the screen if you're watching live on LinkedIn. It's kind of fun to do. Quick introduction to today's guest and today's topic. Uh, today we are doing something that's new in an ongoing collaboration with Multilingual Media, who publishes, of course, Multilingual Magazine. And the February issue of this year was about the Great Gap, Singularity, AI, and MT. And we are doing a little series here to interview some of the authors that are um, that have been featured in the print issue. If you haven't received your print issue, that's probably because you're not subscribed, I would encourage you to go over to multilingual.com and check out the subscription options that are available. We have both print and digital options available. And here on screen you can see the print option of the article that we're going to be going through today. It's called Real World AI Driven Applications Are Signaling a New Frontier in Machine Translation. And I'm joined today by my friend and colleague, Stefan Huey, who is going to recap some of the technologies and perspectives that some innovative localization teams from Blend to Subway, that's right, the sandwich company, have shared at Global Saki's interactive virtual event from last year. This conversation is going to recap an article published that I brought up on screen from the February 23 issue of Multilingual Media. Uh, Real-world AI-driven applications are signaling a new frontier in MT. Stefan uh, has 20 years of experience working in the localization industry as an executive for various high-profile language services companies. He is a localization VP, a globalization consultant, language industry writer, content creator, local lunch ambassador, social media evangelist, LinkedIn growth strategist, client success expert, AI enthusiast, Stefan, welcome to the show, and what did I miss? I think that's a pretty well-rounded introduction, if I do say so yeah, myself. Yeah, I think you summed it up pretty well. Thank you so much, Tucker. How are you? It's so nice to see you. We last saw each other at Lokeworld, I think, in November, yeah, so it's, it's been a while. it's good to see you. We haven't we haven't touched base in a while, and then I think it was Texas before that when, when we were able to meet. That's right. We had some dinner last, uh, last year. We got to do that again one of these days. That I'm, was fun. I'm always down for dinner. <laughs> And I'm always down for a live stream. So thank you for, for joining the show today. And My pleasure. you, sir, you're a friend of the show. You've been here before. You kind of know how it works. We've done these live streams. And you came. I even put on my NIMSY hat. Oh, just I see you. it. I see it. I'm not even wearing my NIMSY cap. I should be wearing that. But you, you spoiled me, sir, because you even provided uh, some slides for us to go through today to, yeah. to help structure our conversation around around your your article in multilingual. So I'd say, you know, when I'm spoiled with slides, I like to kind of just turn it over to you. Why don't you walk us through what you got for us today? Yeah, so well, today we'll be, be talking about the emergence of machine learning and AI and how it's impacting the localization industry. It's, it's stranger than fiction, don't you think? Uh, in the past science fiction scenarios, artificial intelligence involved 
intelligent robot, sometimes friendly, sometimes not so much as uh, we could see in a la Space Odyssey, uh, HAL, or, or something like that. But in reality, AI today usually refers to machine learning, which is a technology that involves software algorithms that can learn and improve at performing tasks as they expose, uh, as they get exposed to more data. And machine learning is enabling numerous groundbreaking tools that are transforming our daily lives. And they're most definitely uh, starting to affect uh, Loke as well. The latest AI applications now offer opportunities to apply machine learning to almost any task. With this technology, computers are trained to recognize patterns and make predictions based on large data sets, allowing for greater efficiency and accuracy without explicit programming. Additionally, the availability of big data and improvements in computing power uh, have enabled AI systems to process and analyze vast amounts of information at uh, a speed beyond human capability. And the localization industry, I believe, is undergoing a fundamental change as mm. these applications are starting to arrive. And I'm excited to examine some of uh, the applications uh, that are being applied real time uh, with you this morning. So you're going to walk us through some of these actual practical examples and using examples, like you mentioned from Global Saki. Shout out to Global Saki. We're going to tell you more about how y'all in the audience can get involved with them in a yep. little bit. Um, you're going to walk us through some of these examples today. I feel like, you know, your article was published in Multilingual back in March and or February. February. And so it's been like a month or two. So <laughs> caveat to all of our AI and large language model and chat GPT aficionados out there, the article might be out of date if it's 30 days old <laughs> because this technology yeah. is going so quickly here. Yeah. Have but. you, you know, one of the things that I find so fascinating is that um, localization and the new AI industry are built on the same foundation uh, language. Right. It, it's natural language processing, NLP, and our ability to make computers consume you, huge amounts of data that are fueling uh, this new AI revolution. And so, you know, NLP is a branch of AI that helps computers understand, interpret, and utilize human language. So it's actually quite ironic that we're coming full circle. It's actually human language uh, that is cracking uh, this AI. Not scientists have tried to crack AI uh, in different ways for a very, very long time. And now they've arrived at the conclusion that teaching uh, machines how to process language makes the most sense um, the development of NLP technologies has increased rapidly, providing computers with the ability to understand and compose text, hear speech, and interpret it. So the importance of NLP and AI research is evident, and it's led to tremendous advancements in the fields. At their best, AI tools perform tasks at much greater speed, scale, and a degree of accuracy than humans, freeing up time for us and resources. So as you said, there've been a dizzying number of new AI applications uh, coming out recently uh, and their scope and impact is broad and diverse. I read the other day that in the last month, there have been over 2000 chat GPT extensions released alone. Wow. That's crazy. I mean, I've seen new AI applications from text to speech engines in multiple languages and a choice of over 100 voices and dialects to smart algorithms being used to analyze text and recognize recurring word patterns. Advanced AI uh, uh, applications are helping users save time with smart features and create artificial images that look 100% realistic. By the way, when I put this presentation together, I, I really uh, went the creative side a little bit, and all the images uh, that are in the presentation uh, were created by prompting Midjourney, uh, one of my favorite AI imagining tools. If you don't know about it, uh, you should go test it out. It's really uh, amazing. And so the, um, these images are all AI generated. They're all AI generated. The one you're looking at is actually a prompt that asks the uh, AI engine to come up with a world uh, and images where uh, 
uh, nothing was produced anymore. Everything was harvested. So you get these wild images where uh, the the farmer is now harvesting uh, donuts uh, in, in the field, and so it's 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 hard. To, you know, it's making it me realize makes... I'm hungry. Looking at all, the, all those donuts, <laughs> I didn't breakfast, breakfast this morning. So. <laughs> Uh, you, you mentioned that you know that it's a match made in heaven here with the um, a AI and large language models in the language services industry. And I, I wanted, before we get too much further here, plug, <laughs> I love this meme that we have. This is a meme from a recent uh, report that NIMSI Insights issued. <laughs> Shows language services buyers basically being kind of lured away by chat GPT. Um, and the LSPs are out there saying, what, what is going on with this? And this, if you haven't checked this out for those listening, uh, we have, if you're a NIMSI partner, I believe this is gated content for NIMSI partners. And if you want more information, what that means to be a NIMSI partner, then reach out to us info at NIMSI.com. But this article, almost six months with chat GPT in the language services industry. And what I love about this article, it was um, lead writer on this was Laszlo Varga from the NIMSI team. What I love about this research is that it's taking a very balanced approach, an analytical approach, a very realistic approach. Um, there's been a lot of hype about um, different models out there right now. And at NIMSI Insights, we're really trying to kind of cut through the hype and see what are the actual real-life practical components, what are people doing it. So sorry to interrupt our presentation, our reg regularly scheduled programming, um, Stefan, but um, please, if you're, if you're watching and you're a NIMSI partner, I encourage you to go check out the recent article from NIMSI Insights. A report, I should say. All right, back to you, Stefan. Let's go on to, right. to the next Good. slide here. I really uh, wanted to focus uh, this morning on giving something of value. And so I concentrated on the question of what are the tools that everyone should be getting to grips with uh, to ensure they understand exactly what AI is capable of in the localization industry today. And as it turns out, AI is enabling localization firms to do things that were previously impossible, like attaining seemingly unlimited scalability, writing self-healing internationalization tools, providing real-time multilingual communication between game players that speak different languages, uh, identifying at-risk content in the source, and reducing uh, the need for editing uh, and even synthetic voices. So those are some of the examples that I'm going to concentrate on this morning. And um, I think we're on slide four now. Tucker, oh. which should be showing Oreo cookies that are being harvested, and uh, we're going to be speaking about unlimited scalability. <laughs> oh, I can't believe these images are all AI generated. I love this. So is, I see Cisco's label up on or logo up on the screen here. Tell me about Cisco. Yeah. So th this was uh, one of those presentations we enjoyed at the Global Sake event uh, last year in Q3. And it was Gary Leffman, uh, their senior localization architect. I'm sure you know him, oh, yeah. uh, Tucker, uh, who was talking. <clears throat> and according to him, um, monolithic uh, applications are going the way of the dinosaurs. Uh, Cisco is now able to deliver unlimited scalability with uh, elastic processors, memory, and storage by implementing and bundling a series of microservices. So it got a little technical. A microservice is a little piece of functional code that performs a single task and is destroyed in the process. And they're extremely fast and cheap. Uh, in traditional monolithic uh, software architecture, the entire application is developed and deployed as a single unit. And as the application grows and the user base increases, it becomes challenging to scale uh, that solution because any change in one part of the application requires rebuilding and redeploying it uh, uh, in the entire application. So that approach is not scalable because it requires more resources and time to maintain um, as it grows. 
So on the other hand, with these microservices, with the microservices architecture, the application is divided into small independent services, each within um, a, a, an individual database, its own database and functionality. And that approach allows each service to be deployed uh, and developed, scaled independently. And because each service is independent of others, changes can be made to one service without affecting uh, the other. So this allows, yeah, go yeah, ahead. So, so essentially rather than like big software suites that are doing everything, it's becoming more compartmentalized and solutions are becoming more, they're smaller, more agile and more custom fit to the individual need at any given moment. And things can be created on, on the fly. So right. it's quite, re quite reactive and it doesn't require an overhaul or a change to the whole system. Now, I'm not a software engineer, so sure, I can't sure. give you the, 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 the super detailed explanation, but it, 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 it certainly describes uh, from what I can tell a, a much more flexible system of uh, reacting and adapting software and allows the, the application to scale much more efficiently as only the services that need scaling can be scaled up or down now. And it totally is depending on, on demand. Moreover, the loosely coupled nature of microservices means that new services can be added or removed as needed, making it easier to adapt to changing, uh, to changing business needs. And the flexibility allows for unlimited scalability as the application can grow and shrink dynamically to meet demand without requiring significant changes to the underlying architecture. So that's huge uh, for a company like Cisco, I am sure. Right. So in summary, microservices uh, provide unlimited scalability by enabling independent scaling of services and allowing for dynamic adaptation to changing uh, business needs, which can help organizations save costs, increase performance and meet user demands more effectively. AI is contributing to the development of these microservices in several ways. Uh, the yeah, that, AI that was my question. So how yeah. is AI, what, what is the role that's being played here? So the AI algorithms can be used to automate the processes of identifying and resolving errors in microservices, reducing the need for manual intervention. And finally, AI can be used to optimize the performance of these microservices, ensuring that they operate efficiently. AI is the contributing is contributing to the development of microservices by enabling the integration of chat box, automating error identification and resolution, and optimizing the performance, which leads us to the next example, which is uh, the next slide is about uh, NetApp Doctor Global. Doctor Global. I, I found a a, a, a beautiful uh, mid journey AI generated science fiction doctor for this uh, particular slide. So it's that's where- The thing of nightmares. <laughs> I'm not sure what to think about that. Yeah. So NatApp, uh, believe it or not, has recently implemented an AI-based source code internationalization solution to enhance their internationalization efforts called uh, Dr. Global. And the, the solution claims to be self-healing. This too, uh, I saw a presentation of that in, in the uh, Global Sake. Uh, self-healing uh, AI, nothing to be afraid of here, right? It's crazy. I mean, and, I, I've and... seen Terminator too. I know what self-healing AI <laughs> looks like. So this software employs machine learning algorithms to identify common coding issues and automatically uh, applies the necessary fixes eliminating the need for manual intervention uh, by developers. And uh, Sorab Kavatakar, the Director of Product and uh, Support Globalization uh, at NetApp, ex expressed uh, dissatisfaction with the previous software internationalization processes and technologies, uh, which he considered inefficient and expensive, and he explained uh, how the traditional static code analysis approach often produced numerous false positive error codes, uh, leading to inconsistent quality and co causing engineers to spend a significant amount of time identifying errors manually. So one of the things he explained was that it was it would be difficult in the past for NetApp to find enthusiasm amongst engineers to go check 
a lot of these errors that they would fish out because there would be a lot of false positives. And so three quarters of the time, the engineer would would go look something up that was flagged as an error only to find that it wasn't. And so it, it was generally met with this perception that they were wasting a lot of time doing this uh, by redeploying the, the, the task to AI. Uh, that kind of disappears, and uh, according to Sarab, uh, that's led to 98% improvement in localization output speed, and it saved over 8,000 hours yeah. and $625,000 in cost fixing the internationalization code. So that's yeah, and that's what we're seeing a lot, like here at NIMSI, where we're when we're working with clients that are implementing AI solutions, or I should say, implementing. I don't want to say I don't want to say AI solutions because I think that's myopic to think of oh we need an AI solution. AI is a tool and it is usually part of a broader solution to be used, right? But when the clients that we've been working with that are implementing AI functionality into their ongoing localization program, we see this common theme that AI isn't the end all be all, but rather it's a productivity enhancer. And it's a great way to be able to do more with less, essentially. And it's greatly enhancing the efficiency with which people can do jobs. You use the example of um, flagging false positives. Oh my gosh, I can't count how many hours in my career I've been, you know, I've spent late night with the JIRA open looking at false positives and closing yeah. them out. And if there's a technology out there that's going to allow me to streamline that process, I'm all for it. Yeah. Yeah. Am amazing. I, can you imagine the poor engineer that had to go look at all these, these false positives? Yeah, I've been that engineer before. <laughs> Right. Doesn't make it. I mean, this is an internal department too. So I mean, I'm sure that that localization as a, a functionality wasn't very popular with these engineers up until now. And now it's the AI performing that particular mind-numbing check. So uh, that's a really uh, cool development, uh, so to speak. On to the next example. What do you say? Next example. Let's check it out. All right. Slide. Uh, slide number six. Uh, Real-time comms, gaming localization reinvented. Yeah, that lady is totally AI, by the way. I mean, it's amazing, right? You, you, would you, you wouldn't be able to tell that if I, if I gave you that picture just like that. It's crazy. Um, yeah. So, Electronic Arts EA has introduced an AI-powered translation quality management system with the help of Content Co. Yep. And uh, the system can work and, with and this all... is where we're seeing a lot of applications with AI um, yeah. is in the quality, in the quality control mm -hmm. um, end of it with hybrid, hybrid quality control models. Yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Keep going. No, no, no problem. So th the system works with all major TMS solutions, that kind of an integration we see all over the map as well. And it's not specific to any specific uh, uh, vendor. So companies can use this solution with whomever they uh, they they are partnering for uh, localization. So AI began researching, believe it or not, in uh, machine translation in 2012, and uh, they started using using it in production in 2019 for over 50 languages. And the ultimate goal. This is a bit mind bending too. I don't think they're quite there yet, but their ultimate goal is to integrate uh, players across cultures and language boundaries and provide real-time localization, which it was explained by uh, Christine, Christina Ansalmi, the machine translation lead for uh, EA, that what they're really looking to do is allow players that speak different languages in different locales to be able to communicate with, with another real time so that if I speak Chinese and you speak uh, Spanish, Tucker, when I'm speaking to you, you're hearing Spanish and I'm, yeah, I'm hearing Chinese. So that's where this is going. Uh, but for now, uh, the approach is still to use machine translation and post editing. Uh, those AI developments uh, are, are in the works, and EA is is hoping in the next couple of years that they uh, that they're going to be able to 
provide gaming on a new level with communications possible between players in different languages. Um, the, the main thing that we discussed in, in or that I thought was rev, uh, revolutionary too in this particular presentation was that through this new team, TMS solution, uh, they're avoiding um, a lot of the rep pen syndrome that humans would have when you uh, edit um, machine translation content. Yeah, because the red the, pen syndrome, because the AI doesn't have an ego and they're not yeah. going to. For those of you out there who haven't heard of red pen syndrome, it's if I give you a piece of paper or a document and a red pen and I say, mark all of the mistakes, mm -hmm you really want to mark mistakes. So you're marking stuff, you're perhaps overcorrecting things that don't need to be corrected. So you're yeah, we've all we've we've all been there in that situation when, when you're you're getting a phone call from the CEO of a company to let you know that the nephew who took two years of, <laughs> of high school French has reviewed your French translation and has found some uh, some errors. And when you get them back, they're all overzealous stylistic things that a lot of times don't even make sense. So this system uh, that was discussed here does a lot of quality metrics and and and, and qualifying uh, the, the, the changes or possible edits so that a lot of this red pen type of syndrome disappears from the editing and unnecessary time is not lost with reviewing mistakes that are uh, that are not productive. I would before we go on here and uh, to the next slide we're halfway through uh, let's head on over to the chat here because uh, I saw that we had a question from Sergio Ruffalo are you aware of any applications thank you for the question Sergio. Are you aware of any application or solution that does image analysis? We are looking to automate the analysis and coding of PDF and JPEG documents. And I should know better than to bring up on screen um, questions I don't have an answer for. But maybe I don't have an I, have, I actually, I, I actually do think that I have some. So I have a new newsletter that I'm that I've been publishing uh, called. AI and Loke. If you're not familiar with it, uh, you can go to my LinkedIn profile and, and find it there. There's three articles uh, that I published just recently showing uh, uh, on my on my main page. And one of the things that I've been doing is researching new applications. And uh, I believe that there are some that are dealing with this particular issue. But of course, I can't call up the information uh, that quickly. But you know, if you subscribe to my newsletter, that this is one of the things that I'm going to be talking about uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and I will also be talking uh, about where you can get educated on AI as a local professional, because I think it's so important. If you're if you're not getting educated on AI right this moment, you're getting left behind. So now is the time to go take some courses. So many of these courses are great and free. So I'm making uh, an article that I'll be releasing in the next couple of days, probably about where you can get some of the AI education if you are so inclined. Anyway, I'm rambling on, but that's no problem. I'm just going to put a link. Whoops. I'm going to put a link here into chat for anybody who wants to go check out that newsletter and subscribe. See, you have over 2,600 subscribers already. Well done. Sir. Yeah. It's a hot topic, yeah. Awesome. And I'm, you know, it motivates me too because because so many people have sub subscribed. I'm really motivated to get good content and to provide uh, value, and so it's it's working out great. I have some great articles coming, so feel free to subscribe. Yeah. I think we're on to slide number seven, unless you had something else you quickly wanted. Yeah, to. Yeah, thanks for the tangent, Sergio. Um, I know there's solutions out there. Um, I just don't have any off the top of my head, but I've been playing around with it. There's tons of AI um, analysis software out there. I will tell you, though, that the real power comes when you're able to actually train the AI engines. And there's a number of providers out there that are doing excellent work with training custom AI engines. 
um, just uh, because they're top of mind right now because I just talked to them, I think, last week on a live stream. Uh, Scientific is is doing a lot of work around AI and helping um, train custom engines for their, their clients and stuff like that. But there are providers out there and solutions. All right, back to you, sir. Slide number seven. Predicting word choices, vector spaces, XTM. What is XTM up to, sir? XTM uh, blew our minds to uh, one of the most advanced developments in multilingual artificial intelligence apparently is happening to vector spaces. And they explore the similarities between words across different languages. Mm -hmm. XTM is using this process to automatically match word correlations between two phrases in different languages. And the ultimate goal is to predict, predict the word choices in the, the target language, which that's, it's quite amazing. However, developing efficient AI technology that can take advantage of vector space, uh, be, spaces between two languages requires a lot of data and a lot of data analysis. And uh, that can only really be provided by the, the big tech companies. One of the reasons that we're making such huge strides in, in the last half year is because companies like Google and Facebook uh, are doing some of this uh, heavy lifting with, with uh, content. Uh, don't know whether you know, but in 2016, uh, Facebook research crawled the entire internet in 157 languages. And in 2017, uh, Babylon Health produced a paper showing a possible method of normalizing the vector space between uh, between two languages. So, XTM International has applied for a U.S. patent on on this te technology, and it would uh, uh, appear that they're trying to again normalize the vector space for 50 languages into the same plane allowing for more accurate similarity calculations and fuzzy matches the, the application obviously is that when you apply this type of technology to the fuzzy matching process that you're going to be able to do a much better job in predicting what the solution should be in a fuzzy match scenario does that make sense tucker yeah kind of it makes as much sense to me as it makes sense to you <laughs> <laughs> so that so so I, I guess what where where the rubber meets the road there is that now with a fuzzy match the the translator might have to do a lot more you know brain searching to find a solution uh, to make it match to the original as where if you have this, uh, this this vector matching technology that can predict what you're gonna see next a lot better than if you have a fuzzy match. It, it can give you a lot better suggestions and right. it's an approach it's that really presents like, and yeah, go ahead. Clean it up. It's an additional layer on top of that. Right. It's kind of like, um, I've heard people talk about using it to, as like a post editing, like automated post editing, which to me is an oxymoron because the whole point of post editing is having a human reviewer, but yeah. it's kind of like going in and doing an additional pass after the machine translation. But in, in this case, the fuzzy matches doing an additional pass on it. Well, I did a, I did a whole post on, on using chat GPT, uh, to, to, help out with translation and one of the the things that i find really helpful is that when you're when you're looking for creative solutions you can actually prompt uh, the thing to to give you a bunch of possibilities that can get you off on the right on the right track it doesn't mean that that it necessarily brings you the solution but it gets you in the in the right direction and i think this is kind of along the same line if the help you're getting from the machine is such that you're getting much more valuable suggestions it's going to save you time in coming up with the right solution which still creatively is maybe picked by a human being but the machine helps you along the way a lot better anyway that was vector spaces by XCM, uh, XCM, and then we're going to uh, well, the next. Sorry, Go I'm, I'm going to interrupt yeah, yeah. again. Before we yeah, get yeah. into this, I want to address some of these comments over here. And Paulina already jumped in and stole my thunder here. Someone was asking about, uh, well, shoot, let's bring it up on screen, shall we? 
uh, chat. Someone's asking about oh, Lordy Lordy. Now I can't find it. Um, uh, it's always great to learn from you, Stefan. It's oh. it's it's it, it, it's a lot of pressure to be live. <laughs> oh, it's so much pressure. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> Is it, oh, here we go. Uh, is there a existing research or data set comparing AI output and MT put output across language pairs? So kind of a multifaceted um, response here. My first response is go check out the work that they do over at Intento. Um, Intento, great work over there. They do a lot of work with machine translation, evaluation, and, this, and the like, and they are kind of a thought leader in this area as well. Um, Intent is coming up. It's coming up shortly in slide number nine, by the way. But with, oh, no, we'll I, be talking about. We'll be talking about that. No, no, it's fine. Paulina it's, stole it's, my thunder. And no, no. You're stealing my, and I'm stealing your thunder. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I mean, we haven't said anything about. Yeah, another. What I'm going to be talking about another resource is Custom MT by um, Nimsy friend Constantine Dranch. They've been putting out a lot of research uh, around around recent developments and they're all about evaluating machine translation as well you can go check them out that's custom.mt and, yeah, and what, but if i can plug that event maybe real quick too we there's an event coming up with them um uh, with regards to uh chat gpt and localization on thursday and friday i'm going to be participating in that in the in the hackathon so if you go to their website uh you can sign up for that as well and that deals specifically with prompt engineering for the localization industry uh in in chat gpt with some really hands-on uh there's a hands-on hackathon on friday where you can actually participate in in real-time experience with prompting gpt in a number of use cases nice uh, so that's going to be fascinating and really uh, fun for people to to participate in if they're interested nice all right yeah definitely go check that out and the last resource I'll mention is, I'll just refer back to NIMSI Insights. Uh, we have uh, a bunch of ongoing research on this topic right now. And we, we do kind of mention this in the, the research that we've already published, uh, showing some of the differences between neural machine translation and large language models, and kind of how to calibrate expectations around that. One of the key takeaways here is that with large language models for the evaluation of it, there's, there's not a great standardized model for evaluating the, the output of it yet. Uh, with machine translation, of course, we have industry standard metrics, blue scores, uh, meteor scores. I, I've, there's so many that are available. But one of the trends that we're seeing here at NIMSI is the with the advancements in the um, generative text or AI, um, what we're seeing is those old scores are becoming less and less relevant because they're not fully able to capture a lot of what's going on as you put that additional layer of AI on top of the machine translation. So that's my layman's report on some resources. Intento, Custom MT, Nimsy Insights, of course. Of course, I've got to say Nimsy Insights. But all right, Stefan, back to you. All right, we are on... Uh slide number eight which is the pro course slide with one of the most wild images that i came across this prompt for mid journey was to uh so like one, one of the key things i have to say all of these images are generated with ai yeah. and uh, that's disturbing because if these images if some of these images were generated by a human i'd have to like ask is everything okay like <laughs> do, do you need to talk to someone a professional these are kind of disturbing. Yeah, I just, I, and I'm sorry for including this one. I couldn't help myself. I just thought this one was really funny because the, the prompt said something like, you know, make me an image uh, of people eating lava. And so that's essentially what it is. There's a bunch more that you can find online that are even more disturbing. I picked one of the lesser uh, evil well, ones, so to, so, so, so to speak. But I I thought it was uh, it was fun enough to include. Anyway, pro anyway, core. Pro that's, core. Procore is what we're on. I um, think a lot of people know what Procore does. Um, they're in the process of 
implementing an AI-based content management system uh, that facilitates the localization of their content base, which is comprised of more than 3,500 articles and five million at about a rate of five million words per language, covering 10 languages. And they brought in uh, John Ritzdorf, uh, who- uh, Shout out who to John. Was, yeah, John yeah shout out to John, which, good guy. Um, he, he aims for the system uh, to enable AI to detect errors in substandard source content and identify at-risk content up front. So much of the effort, I think, now is turning to the source content uh, versus the, the, the target content. If we can clean up our source, we've known this for a long time. Obviously, if we can clean up the source, it's so much easier to do the translation and localize it. Before, that was a lot more difficult, but now the system can recognize content produced by non-native writers and as well as technical language that may be unclear to a non-technical audience and flag outdated content that, not, that does not align with Procore's brand tone and voice. Um, and, and based on uh, the analysis, <clears throat> Procore can make a decision on whether to revise the source text before they even decide to translate it. So that's really a, a, a fundamental change in, in methodology. Uh, we all know that within companies, there might be so much variety. I deal with this type of an issue all the time where <clears throat> one department wants it one way, the other department wants it another way. At some point, the wires get crossed and all hell breaks loose. Here, you actually, uh, with the AI technology, you're going to have the possibility to unify the voice and simplify the language before you even move it into translation or localization. So uh, the, the AI technology is also employed to assess the appropriateness of the, the target content and analyzing its quality automatically um, to, to determine if additional linguistic quality assurances is, is necessary. And the resulting data is then utilized to retain machine uh, translation engines. And uh, Procore claims that this innovative method has allowed uh, to allocate their subject matter expert, expert sources much more effectively, focus on the most challenging and highly customized content that requires rewriting and, and ignoring some of the lesser tasks that would take away time before. So that's a really creative implementation as well, I thought. Yeah, so uh, we see this a lot. A lot of work, because when we think of using um, ChatGPT, we think of creating content and transforming content. Uh, if, you, if you think about localization, translation is essentially just transforming content from one language to another. But there's a lot of really interesting applications that you know, frankly aren't new. They've been around for a while depending upon the, the provider that you talk to. But there's a lot of really interesting applications around analyzing content. So we get source content in and we need to analyze what's gonna be the best workflow for this. What is the content type? What is the style? What is the tone? Um, who's the best translator that I should send this to? What are the best style guides to apply to it? So the analyzing content on the front end, I should say before um, going into localization is a big application here. All right, let's look at text-to-speech. Text to speech, my good friend Carrie Livermore Fisher, another big celebrity in the industry. Um, she is the manager of globalization services at Subway, and she recently turned to machine translation and Intento uh, in response to the increased demands for e learning content, uh, in particular during the pandemic. Uh, resulting in substantial cost savings uh, for Subway. And uh, they were able to save 46% on the translation of video content in four languages and accelerate production by at least a, a couple of months by applying AI-generated text-to-speech. Uh, and that solution completed the, the task at 41% at a 41% cost savings. And that doesn't even include the time and effort that it would, would have gone into recruiting, uh, qualifying the, the human voice talent. So in, 
instead of doing it that way, they're now uh, having intent to help them generate text to speech uh, automatically. And um, they return, they received a return on their investment of over a, a thousand percent in one year with the implement implementation of AI driven MT in three major projects. So um, that's a, a, a short case study that shows you a, a real time application as well. Well, this is just turning into a paid advertisement or sponsored content for Intento. <laughs> I think it was not on it was not on purpose. You, so uh, you bring up text to speech, and I'm gonna just once again commandeer the um, the presentation for a little bit to give to insert some of my own slides here. Um, one thing that we've noticed, and this is from this is from a report presentation we did for a client. Um, I should make sure there's no client names in here um last week so it's top of mind for me and one of the things i wanted to um one of the points that i think is worth talking about is with text-to-speech and synthetic voices is that a synthetic voices are getting a lot better <laughs> they're getting a mm. lot better there's still an uncanny valley situation going on where they don't sound quite human but on the other side of the technolog technological advancements that we're seeing with text-to-speech and synthetic voices, what we're seeing is, and the research, there's research to back this up, that users' perceptions of synthetic voices have changed a lot, even in, in just in recent years. And if you think about it, you know, a lot of us are living in a situation where we've had synthetic voices around. We've been surrounded by them. I've got Alexa devices in my house, I've got Siri that talks to me on the phone. And so we've become a much more accustomed and therefore tolerant of hearing synthetic voices. And I just wanted to bring that up because it's, it's, it's an important factor to consider because synthetic voices are becoming a much more viable option today than they were even just three to five years ago. You know, it's really scary, Tucker. Uh, I have... Uh... Well, you know that that I do a lot of video uh, footage in my mm -hmm. posts on LinkedIn, and I have this one uh, video clip saved that I'm making a post with. I haven't used it yet, but I'll describe it to you real quick. It's Leonardo DiCaprio at the UN giving a speech, and his voice every 10 seconds gets replaced by a different actor, and it follows his lips and it's it's crazy it's like he changes voice every yeah. 10 seconds it is really yeah. really amazing the future is now so. yeah all right uh what do we got next we've got reducing edit distance yeah so blends. that's that's blend that's helping fl smith uh, a global company that provides equipment engineering and service solutions to the cement and mining industries who would have thought that there would be such a big need at that type of company, but, but they're worldwide and they have a hundred, uh, they have 10,000 employees in more than 60 countries that require between nine and 10 million words of translation per year. I think this is one of the tendencies that I see too, is that a lot more companies are considering using localization than in the past and the need for our services is continuously growing. AI is going to enable us to help service some of that need, I believe. And so, um, you know, I, I know there's a lot of fear out there in the industry uh, because of AI, but I think it's going to help us service some of the scenarios that otherwise would have been either cost prohibitive or companies would have wouldn't wouldn't even considered uh, using uh, localization services or localizing things. So uh, this company require requires between nine and ten million words of translation per year in over 120 languages, primarily for technical documentation and the use of digital solutions. And uh, the legacy translation memories no longer provided sufficient cost savings or time savings to FL Smith. And so they turned to, to machine translation and the help of, of Blend. And uh, they are able to 
reduce the editing distance, the post editing distance now with the help of blend and AI technology to between three and seven and a half percent resulting in a significant cost savings. So that's kind of a, a, a last example that I quickly wanted to give. Um, and then I have a, a final uh, slide uh, on uh, synthetic voices. Got it. That kind of circles back to it. It it it, it has a, an example from Mid Journey that's a little bit more abstract, but I thought just as amazing. I, I want to see the prompt they used to to come up with that image. Um, uh -huh. But anyway, we're we're uh, Space Tune gave an, an example of uh, how they are replacing voices. Uh, or, or voiceovers in uh, Arab speaking Middle East countries uh, with uh, AI explain synthetic voice technology. And that incorporates AI driven technology to assist with voice uh, localization. Although speech recognition and machine translation have been embraced as useful tools to automate and increase efficiency. Humans remain at the center of the, the operation, uh, according to Hassan Sawaf from AXplain. Uh, the station primarily broadcasts Asian content and localizes it for an Arabic-speaking audience. And Space Tune sought a dependable process to ex extend the life of some of its legacy characters, including the UF robot Grandizer, uh, and to preserve the quality of the actor's voice uh, and in future productions. The example that was given was essentially the example of the audience. Um, don't know whether you're familiar with this type of phenomenon, um, Tucker, but mm. let's say in, in, in a country where content is dubbed, um, the audience might get familiar with a voice Oh, sure. uh, and the voice of Grandizer was a particular actor. When that actor passed away, the production company was, you know, a bit in a jam because they knew that if they would just replace the, the, the voice with somebody else, the audience would be ostracized right. with, the, with the new voice, so to speak. And now with these synthetic voices that can be produced, they can actually replicate the original voice of Grandizer in Arabic exactly the same way. So the goal is to provide a tool that artists and directors who may not be technically inclined can use and produce artificial voice recordings that can be customized to make to meet various cultural expectations and express the appropriate uh, emotions of, of the target language. Amazing stuff that goes along the same line as that clip that I'm sitting on that I will post one of these days with Leonardo DiCaprio speaking in, in the, in the voice of a bunch of yeah. different actors. It, it solves a lot of challenges. I mean, there, there are ethical implications around this for sure. Most definitely. I don't think we want to get into today. That's a whole different podcast, That's a, Yeah, but it's, it provides a lot more flexibility. That's one of the biggest challenges of having voiceover talent is keeping consistency if you know paying retainers to make sure that people are still under contract so that you can still have the same voiceover talent um mm -hmm. over and over again with synthetic voices it's it's creepy and i think what we're going to be seeing is well it, uh, we've seen this already I, I was reading in the news don't quote me on this because i don't have a source to to link but isn't it i think it was bruce willis that sold the rights to his voice to some company like microsoft so that they can create create content with this voice. It's really interesting. And another interesting anecdote, and I don't even that I was hearing about, and I don't know if there's even anything published, at least not in English speaking media about this, but our a company called Translated out of Italy. A lot of yeah. you, you guys have heard of Translated, surely, right? Yeah. And they they've done they've been on the forefront of using artificial intelligence in, in translation. A lot of the stuff that we're talking about today, they've been doing for years and years and years and years and years. Um, today, it's just becoming more publicly accessible. But anyways, one of the things that they were doing is they have an initiative where um, they were originally contacted by someone that was losing their voice because of 
a medical condition. They were losing the ability to speak, and they hadn't lost it yet. And rather than eventually have to have a synthetic voice, you know, like um, Stephen Hawking style, where it's a very computerized yeah. voice, um, Translator was taking the voice and getting recordings of him so that when they lost their voice, they were actually able to have a synthetic voice that sounded like them. So That's amazing. this is this is the future. And yeah. it's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. All right. I'm Holistic localization. So um, I already told you about my uh, AI and local newsletter and in the framework of that newsletter, I actually came up with this idea myself, thinking about the possibilities of AI. And um, I, I thought about how localization providers could save their international clients time and money by offering a more holistic service. Marketing across culture uh, is a challenge that cannot be solved by simply translating content. However, conducting extensive market research for every target group worldwide can be an expensive and time consuming undertaking that is not in everybody's budget. So I therefore suggest that LSPs could use AI to automate the initial content diagnosis process and make it more efficient and effective. And we could potentially create one of the first truly comprehensive AI solutions in LOC and enhance localization uh, services. So I imagine building an AI model called uh, Global Genius AI, that's the placeholder uh, title I gave it, uh, which would be trained to conduct a thorough initial content diagnosis for localization purposes. And uh, the model would be able to analyze content and then maybe by using reinforcement learning from human feedback, uh, a feature that enables the model to learn from feedback given by language experts who are experienced in the field, they could get better. And then um, we could give Global Genius AI access to the in in entire international marketing history of a company, including real-time information uh, gathered at the point of interaction and make AI come up with suggestions as to how the product or the marketing should be best done uh, overseas. The model would also uh, be able to connect with different models to complete different tasks. And, and my system uh, obviously wouldn't work without AI. It, it would be kind of a first line of, of resolve. So much of our conversations in the last couple of years have been about how to convince the C-suite that localization is a worthwhile effort if and and how to integrate right. and give localization a, a, a seat at the say marketing international marketing table if we can come up with something that can integrate with international marketing a lot easier and make it make the barrier to entry for localization in international market low international marketing lower then the potential implications of that solution could be significant providing the lsps with a competitive advantage uh, providing you know market research and analysis and personalization compliance even regulatory support uh, yeah. up front yeah and I, I think a good point here is uh, you made the point like localization it's it's the tragic history of localization is we're always fighting for a seat at the table or at least some of the breadcrumbs that fall down from the table because the c-suite often doesn't understand localization but c-suites are eager to spend money on AI and the localization programs that are cautiously not just jumping in right like it's we want to we want to stress we want to be responsible about where we invest in things right and there's still very much a hype curve type situation going on with everything but the companies that are cautiously investing into AI from a localization standpoint are well getting when they go to the c-suite and talk about ai it's a much more interesting conversation than if they're just talking about uh, localization fuzzy matches lqa scores and stuff like that that the c-suite tip typically isn't so so um keen to talk about we have one minute left stefan and i <laughs> you summarized a lot of stuff from the recent global sake conference and i want to make sure um that we're 
talking about them. Uh, give us a plug for Global Saki, would you? You know, Global Saki is wonderful. Anybody who's in, in international marketing or localization is well suited to go to their events. You're going to get the biggest value ever because especially for localization people, you get to actually see real life examples of solutions uh, that the localization industry provides. And so it's in enriching from that perspective and enlightening. So uh, there's two events coming up in June. There's a, a virtual event on June 15th. And there's also an in-person event in San Francisco on June the 22nd. Uh, and I'm, I've booked, I've, I'm booking I'm... my... Th I'm booking my ticket for that one. So I, yeah. if you're coming, you'll see me there. I think I'll be there. I haven't booked my tickets yet, but I'm pretty sure I'll be there. We're, we're discussing the joys of travel budgeting internally here at Nimsy Insights. Um, but yeah, I'll see you there. It'll be good to actually see you in person again, Stefan. Let's, um, yes, sir. before we really wrap up today, I want to give a shout out. Very active chat today to a lot of the people um, here in chat, board, uh, let's see, oh my goodness. Alice, Hannah, Karina, Paulina, Boriana, Paz, Roderick, Paulina again, um, Fessel, Momen, Daniel, Paulina, you are taking over my chat, I love it. <laughs> Roderick, Momen, Sergio, of course, thanks again for the question. And I ran out of space. So um, everybody that I wasn't able to get to in chat, thank you so much for joining this and making this an actual and, event. And thank you for your support. I recognize so many so many of those names. I really appreciate it, guys, for coming out and listening to us this, uh, this morning. See you next time. Yeah, the, the Stephen Huey um, fan club showed up in <laughs> full force. So thank All you right. for that. All Thank right, you. ladies, gentlemen, chat, we are out of time for today. If you enjoyed this Nimsy Live experience, join us next time. We don't have a next time because it's not scheduled yet. I've got like three or four things. We've got Kirti Vashi joining us um, in the next month. We've got Tim Jung. We've got Michael Klinger. We've got a lot of good stuff coming up. So make sure that you are subscribed to Nimsy Insights so that you'll be notified when we get those live streams on the schedule. And you can join us next time. Uh, once again, my name is Tucker Johnson, host of Nimsy Live. It has been my pleasure to join you all today. I appreciate our guest, Stefan Huey. I appreciate my colleagues here at Nimsy Insights doing all of the hard work so I can have these fun conversations. I appreciate everybody in our industry who fills out Nimsy's surveys and schedules briefings with our analysts so that we can include you in our published industry research. And finally, I appreciate you, the audience in chat who are joining us live today. I appreciate the dialogue, the questions, the comments, and especially the criticisms. And I look forward to next time. Cheers.